Ultrasound is an incredible tool for visualizing soft tissue structures all over the body, but how well does it work when what you want to scan is encased in bone? In this video, we'll discuss the rationale and technique for imaging the spine with ultrasound and offer some tips and tricks that should make accessing the spinal or epidural space a piece of cake. Now, if you're sticking needles in patients' backs on a regular basis, I wouldn't blame you for feeling like you don't need a machine to increase your success rate. Isn't adding ultrasound just making a simple procedure more complicated? Many times, yes, but then again, even the best amongst us struggle with challenging spines now and again, and ultrasound may offer a lifeline in those circumstances. Perhaps more important is the issue of where to place a needle for spinal anesthesia or lumbar puncture. Our friend Theodore Tuffier, way back in 1900, taught us that a line drawn between the two iliac crests should pass through the body of the L4 vertebra. Since we knew that the spinal cord ends at L1 in adults, this became the way to ensure that your insertion site was below the conus medullaris, and for 100 years, trainees have been taught that this is a safe practice. There's a problem, though. When we compare our palpation skills to cold, hard imaging, we are off. Sometimes way off. You see, Tufier's line is a radiologic landmark. The crests will be at the L4 level on an X-ray. The thing is, we don't usually feel the bony crests. Because this. Most of us have some padding on top of those hips, and so what we think is L4 might actually be L3 or 2, or even L1 in some cases. So if you want to know precisely how to avoid impaling the spinal cord, imaging is your friend. Enter ultrasound. Now, in order to interpret the ultrasound images, we need to understand how a lumbar vertebra is built. We have the body, the pedicles, the transverse processes, the articular processes, the laminae, and the spinous process. There are two conventional orientations for spine scanning. The first is sagittal or parasagittal. If we place the probe over the midline in the sagittal orientation, we don't see much at all. And that's because we're directly over the spinous processes and the supraspinous ligament, and these are a barrier to sound penetration. If we move laterally, we see a row of triangular structures. These are the laminae. They look like the tail of an alligator. Remember that view. It's a useful one, as we'll see in a second. Keep going, and you'll find yourself over the articular processes. These look like a series of rounded speed bumps, as in, whoa, you've gone too far, the laminae are back that way. And for completeness, here's what the transverse processes look like. Isolated shelves of bone casting shadows down through the psoas muscle. Okay, so let's move back to the laminae. Notice that you really can't see much beyond the bony triangles. Maybe I see a hint of a deeper structure here, but mostly it's just shadow. If we tilt the probe medially, just slightly, now we have a window into the spinal canal, seen here in green. This makes anatomic sense. It's often the case in elderly spines that the midline approach results in bony contact again and again. Meanwhile, the paramedian approach almost never fails to provide a window or two into the spinal canal, and so we'll take advantage of that when using our ultrasound beam. The other orientation is transverse. Here we see a faint shadow of the spinous process, and this is because we're imaging the spine through the interspinous space. We can also see the laminae in cross-section, as well as the articular processes. Depending on the depth and level you're at, you may or may not see the transverse processes extending laterally about here. See that dark circle in the center? That's the spinal canal. Superficial to it is what we call the posterior complex, a thin band of hyperechoic tissue that comprises the dura and the ligamentum flavum. If you're really lucky, you can see a hint of both structures, but usually we're happy to see a single line. Deep to that is the anterior complex, which is made up of the anterior dura and the vertebral body. And of course, the space between them is the thecal sac and its contents. This view has a characteristic shape, reminiscent of the face of a bat, with the articular processes as ears and the posterior complex as the top of its head. Now, if you happen to find yourself over a spinous process in the transverse orientation, you won't see all that much. Sliding cephalad or caudad or applying some tilt will usually get the beam back into the interspinous space. Now that we have a sense of the sonoanatomy, we have to decide how we're going to use the ultrasound. Most of the time, we're using it as an assist device. We find and mark the spinal level, then determine the midline and the depth of the posterior complex. Using it to guide the needle into the subarachnoid space, or less commonly, the epidural space, is not done routinely, but can be helpful in certain challenging circumstances. Here's a typical scanning sequence for ultrasound-assisted neuraxial procedures. We start at the sacrum in the parasagittal orientation with that slight medial tilt. The broad shelf of bone is the sacrum. 
Heading north, we see a break in the bony line. This is the first interlaminar space of L5-S1. We see the L5 lamina, and then the L4-5 interlaminar space, and then the L4 lamina, and then the L3-4 space, and so on. Once we find the space we want, we center the gap, and then using a skin marker from the center of the ultrasound probe, make a horizontal line corresponding to that inner space. We then turn the probe 90 degrees, and search for the bat sign, trying to stay close to our original horizontal line. Once we center the midline, we draw a vertical line from the probe upward. At this point, we can freeze the image and use the electronic calipers to measure the distance from the posterior complex to the surface. This gives us an approximation of how deep we can expect to find either the epidural or the subarachnoid space. Remember that we're usually compressing the skin with the probe, so the actual distance may be a centimeter or two longer depending on how much soft tissue is being squeezed. The two lines we've drawn give us the crosshairs to begin our needle insertion, and we know the depth from our measurement, so we're all set up for success. This pre-procedural ultrasound scanning has been shown to confer a number of benefits in both novice and experienced clinicians, including reduced risk of failure, fewer needle redirections, and significantly higher first attempt success rates. Scanning is most useful for the lumbar spine, but there is some utility in the thoracic spine too, Starting our parasagittal scan out laterally, we see rounded ribs and pleura between them. Sliding medially, we see a transition to squared off transverse processes and then to flattened laminae. We don't see alligator triangles in the thorax because the laminae are naturally more flat. Note the bright spot between the laminae. That's our posterior complex, and while it's really hard to see beyond that in the thoracic spine, we can use that to measure the distance and vector to laminae and then just walk off cephalad into the epidural space. Scoliosis is common and can mess up your best spinal day. Ultrasound helps by alerting you to the rotational defect common in most scoliotic patients. Rotating the probe to counter that effect, so you see the spinous process aiming straight north, gives you the vector to aim for. In some challenging cases, it does make sense to visualize that small acoustic window and advance a needle in real time. Here we see the sacrum and the L5 lamina, with an acoustic window through the posterior complex. A needle is advanced in plane from caudad to cephalad, aiming for the complex. If bony contact is made, a slight redirection cephalad usually allows a needle to slide home. Do we use ultrasound for every neuraxial procedure? No. However, there are several situations in which it makes a lot of sense, especially given the evidence to support it. First off, patients with poor landmarks in whom palpating a midline is not going to happen. We'll pull it out routinely for patients with bony deformity, especially the 45 kilo grandma whose spine looks like a pretzel, and you just know you're going to struggle with bone, bone, bone. And then we have a subset of patients for whom you really want the needling to go as smoothly as possible on the first try, and for whom a pre-procedural scan is prudent. Patients with mild coagulopathy, patients at risk for spinal cord trauma, patients at risk for postural puncture headache. When the stakes are high, ultrasound is your friend. Ultrasound imaging of the spine is easy to learn and is an excellent skill to have in your back pocket.